As you, you know, there are many people throughout the ages have, who have known the Word of God. They've preached it, they've teached it, they've sung about it, they've even beat people with it. But in the midst of it, they did not know the voice of the Lord. And I'm just very grateful for impact and how you all are teaching me to lean into that voice. And I'm just excited about the journey that I'm on with the Holy Spirit. Um, so this morning I went to Impact Prayer, and while I was there, I was talking to Laura, and she said, well, how's it going? You ready for tonight? And I said, yeah, this whole week I've just been like taking in all the commentaries on the book of Hosea because I feel that's where the Lord has me to speak from. And, and she said, so it sounds like you've had a lot of a lot, of a lot going on with uh, your learning and your feasting and your eating with the Lord. And, and I said, yeah, but pray for me that it comes together, that there's flow tonight. And so she says, well, the Lord says you need to put down your commentaries and your notes and go for a run. So I was like, okay, I like to run. So I went home, put the commentaries and the notes down, and I went for this long run. And before I left, I chose to leave my phone at home because I usually I like to go for long runs, and so I like to listen to music because, to be candid with you, it's kind of scary between these two ears by myself for too long. And so, but I heard, I heard the voice say, but take your phone because, like Laura said, you're going to get a download. You're going to want to record that. And I was like, I just don't want to be bothered by it. So I get out on my run, and uh, less than a mile into it, it's like this download just flooded me, wave after wave of God's instruction and his voice of his heart. And I'm like, I'm, I'm literally laughing out loud while I'm running. I'm crying. <laughs> I'm actually screaming. And at other times, I was whispering because I was passing people on the sidewalk, and I didn't want them to think I was crazy. And it was like the best time with the Lord that I've ever had. And uh, an hour later, I got back to the house, and I couldn't wait to text Laura and say, it worked. I got the download. <laughs> and just when I went to send it, I was waiting for her to say, well, what, what was it? And I'm like, I don't know, Lord. What was the download? <laughs> He's like, I told you to take your recorder. And I'm like, well, you, you got to bail me out. You got to give it to me. He's like, well, okay, I will. I'll give it to you again. Go back to where you came from. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, go back to where I gave it to you from. I'm like, so I got to put my running shoes on <laughs> and go back again. So that's what we did. So an hour later, we had it on recorded. And it was very special. I will encourage you all that I don't plan on giving a two-hour <laughs> download to you. I'm an executive, executive summary kind of guy myself. But I did hear the Lord say, I don't want you to give answers tonight. Um, my, this, you live in a culture of answers. And he said, Daniel, I don't want you to be the answer man. And so tonight I'm going to share some reflections of my heart, the heart of the Father, and hopefully ask some probing questions. Um, well, so many of you know that... In the news recently, there's been a big book release. This was a couple weeks ago. And that book release was the audio, 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 uh, autobiography, the memoir of a Hollywood celebrity, Demi Moore. And let's see if we can. So there we go, Reflections from the Heart. Uh, in her memoir, she caught the attention of all the major news and media outlets around the world, not only because she was a Hollywood celebrity, but also because of how shocking her personal revelations were about some of the darkness in her life. Some of the highlights of that scandalous activity included how she snuck out of her bachelorette party the night before her first wedding to have sex with a man that she had met on a movie um, set earlier that week. And I, th I thought about, like, why is the media obsessed with this? And then it dawned on me, because of the brokenness of humanity, we can say to ourselves, I know I've done some really bad things, but I would never and have never done that. That's just scandalous. She, she also goes on to reveal that dentist was her drug dealer, 
and that she consumed levels of cocaine on a daily basis that caused a hole in her nostril. Talked about her relationship, marriage with her second husband, Bruce Willis, and their three children. And then she caught the eye and the ear of the millennial generation as she talked about her relationship with Ashton Kutcher. Is that how you say his name? Um, you can tell I'm not in that generation. And she went on to say how she felt that third marriage to a young man 15 young, years younger than her was her chance for a do-over and how she would do anything to make it right and to live that life that she felt that she had missed out on. And this is coming from a woman now in her 50s. And she went on to say that she gave up 20 years of sobriety in order to be that fun person that she thought he wanted. And she even got real scandalous and said that she even agreed to threesomes with him in order to fulfill his fantasies. And so I just want to read to you that prologue because I think it speaks to the scandalous nature of where we're going next, straight out of the Word of God. But she starts it out by saying, the same question kept going through my head. How did I get here? In the empty house where I had been married, where we'd added on because I had more kids than bedrooms, I was now completely alone. I was almost 50. The husband who I thought was the love of my life had cheated on me and then decided he didn't want to work on our marriage. My children weren't speaking to me. No happy birthday calls. No Merry Christmas texts. Nothing. Their father, a friend I counted on for years, was gone from my life. The career I scrambled to create since I moved out of my mother's apartment when I was 16 years old was stalled, or maybe it was over for good. Everything I was attached to, even my health, had abandoned me. I was getting blinding headaches and losing weight scarily fast. I looked like I felt destroyed. Is this life, I wondered? Because if this is it, I'm done. I don't know what I'm doing here. I was going through the motions, doing whatever seemed like it needed doing, feeding the dogs, answering the phone. A friend had a birthday, and some people came over. I did what other people were doing. I don't know the people she hangs out with, but she said, sucked on, in on a hit of nitrous oxide, and then and when the joint reached me on the sunken couch in my living room, I took a puff of synthetic pot, because of course those go together. Uh, the next thing I remember, everything went blurry, and I could see myself from above. I was floating out of my body into swirling colors, and it seemed like maybe this was my chance. I could leave the pain and shame of my life behind. The headaches and the heartache and all the sense of failure as a mother, a wife, a woman would just evaporate. But there was still that question, how did I get here? After all the luck and success that I had as an adult, after all the running I had to do to survive my childhood, after a marriage that started out feeling like magic to the first person I'd ever really tried to show my whole self to, after I'd finally made peace with my body and stopped starving and torturing it, waging war on myself with food as the weapon. And most importantly, after I'd raised my three daughters and done everything I could to make myself the mother I never had, did all of that struggle really add up to nothing? Suddenly I was back in my body convulsing on the floor and I heard someone scream, call 911. I yelled no because I knew that what would come next, the ambulance, the paparazzi, the TMZ announcing Demi Moore rushed to the hospital on drugs. And all that happened just as I knew it would, but something else happened that I didn't expect. I decided to sit still after a life of running and face myself. I'd done a lot in 50 years, but I don't know that I really experienced a lot because I spent most of that time not quite there, afraid to be in myself, convinced I didn't deserve the good and frantically trying to fix the bad. How did I get here? This is my story. Now, for all that scandalous activity that the media outlets like to um, keep sending our way, one, one of the other things that she acknowledged was when she was 15 years old, a man that her father knew raped her and then informed her afterwards that her mother had actually sold her and said, how's it feel to be whored out by your mother for $500? 
And so we have a little glimpse of how she got there and that being her story. And so I said, well, there's one of the world's autobiographies. And I hear the Lord say to me, well, let's give them a different one, one that has a similar story, but with a different ending. And so he took me to Hosea. Now, I worked really hard to find an updated, photoshopped <laughs> cover for Hosea's memoir, his autobiography, but this is all I found. Uh, interestingly enough, on Wikipedia, Wikipedia, which this came from, I learned that today is the feast day, October 17th for Hosea. Interesting little fact. Um, but the Lord led me to, to this book. This is a 14-chapter book of the Bible, Minor Prophet, one of the first writing prophets. And I'm not going to read all 14 chapters, but I will kick us off uh, using the message version of the first chapter, which tells you what it's about to tell you through the rest of the 14 chapters. The first time God spoke to Hosea, he said, find a whore and marry her. Make this whore the mother of your children. And here's why. This whole country has become a whorehouse, unfaithful to me, God. Hosea did it. He picked Gomer, daughter of Dibliam. She got pregnant and had a, gave, us, gave him a son. Then God told him, name him Jezreel. It won't be long now before I'll make the people of Israel pay for the massacre at Jezreel. I'm calling it quits on the kingdom of Israel. Payday is coming. I'm going to chop Israel's bows and arrows into kindling in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer got pregnant again this time. She had a daughter. God told Hosea, name this one no mercy. I'm fed up with Israel. I've run out of mercy. There's no more forgiveness. Judah's another story. I'll continue having mercy on them. I'll save them. It will be their God who saves them, not their ornaments and their armies, not their horsepower and their manpower. After Gomer had weaned no mercy, she got pregnant yet again and had a son. God said, name him nobody. You've become nobodies to me, and I, God, am a nobody to you. But down the road, the population of Israel is going to explode past counting, like sand on the ocean beaches. In the very place where they were once named nobody, they will be named God's somebody. Some, everybody in Judah and everybody in Israel will be assembled as one people. They'll choose a single leader. There will be no stopping them. A great day in Jezreel. And where the Lord finally brought me was to a passage that was in between the first and the 14th chapter, Hosea 6.6. 6. And he said, this is my heart. This is my voice for, for you, Daniel, and for your message tonight, which is, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Now, mind you, I'm still in training. So I said, well, Lord, how do I know that this is your voice? This is the key scripture that you want me to focus in on and that you're speaking. And so this morning I went, when I was at Thursday morning prayer, which is just an open forum where we hear from the Lord and we share what we're heal hearing, Chris from the phone says, here's what I hear the Lord saying. The Lord is saying, go and learn. Matthew 9, 12 through 13. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. The Lord is saying, go and learn. I have called you to myself, yes, but I have also called you to go. Go and tell of my mercy and forgiveness. You must go to learn. I do not desire for you to stay inside the four walls of your church or home offering only what you have to only me. Go, go out, go to others. Go show my mercy and tell of my forgiveness. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice. If you don't care about the people I have marked for salvation, I do not care about your religion. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. 
I said, well, that's cool. <laughs> because I hadn't shared with anybody what the Lord was telling me to share. And so in that confirmation um, and that unity, I found encouragement that the Lord is speaking to his people. You know, he, in Hebrews, it says, do not, do not neglect the assembly of gathering together. Uh, actually, it starts out, um, how shall you um, love each other and build each other up in love by not neglecting the assembly, as is the habit of some. And so, quite honestly, this morning at Thursday, I was like, I don't have time to go that. I have to keep preparing. <laughs> And so I went to prayer only for the Lord to show up and say, I'm going to give you confirmation, and I'm going to do it the way that I operate, and it's through the unity of my body. So, Chris, thank you for your faithfulness in hearing from the voice of the Lord and for gathering together, not neglecting the gathering of the saints and encouraging your brother in training here. Well, I asked the Lord, I said, well, what does, the, what does it mean? What does it mean to not desire mercy, not to desire sacrifice, but to love mercy? That passage, by the way, that Chris was reading from is Matthew 9. And the context around it is while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And I like the message version, which says Jesus overhearing, Shot back. Who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? Go figure out what this scripture means. I'm after mercy, not religion. I'm here to invite outsiders, not coddle insiders. Some reflections from my heart on all this as I listen to the Lord's heart. I grew up in a family of physicians. My grandfather was a physician. My dad was a physician. And my grandfather was, sadly, a very cruel man. He was married to the most precious uh, of a woman who made up for a lot of his failings. Uh, interestingly enough, um, my grandmother was Grandmother Ewing. So when I started coming here, uh, some of you might not have seen it, but we, uh, this location is right next to Ewing Sprinkler System. I said, well, is that a side, Lord? Because I know I had a praying grandmother, and it was Margaret Ewing, but very special to me. Um, but my father, who is the namesake of my grandfather, he received not the love and affection that you would expect or hope for from a father. And he followed the path of my grandfather, which was to become a doctor, become a physician. So he carried his name, and then he carried his occupation, and then he carried it right into the very hospital that my grandfather was working out of. And so while he did that, the only thing my father knew how to do was be the commander and make demands. And so I grew up in a household of performance, and you needed to perform. I was number five of seven children. So I was, if I wasn't getting in trouble, nobody knew I was there. So I earned a master's in getting in trouble. Uh, but I learned from an early age the demand to perform. And so in fourth grade, I started cheating academically. I don't think I even knew what I was doing at the time. I just knew that if I don't produce, I'm in trouble. So I took in um, a cheat sheet. It was a spelling test. And I took in this cheat sheet, and I got an A. And I'll never forget the feeling I felt when I won the approval of my dad. And so in my fourth grade mind, I thought, OK, this is how it's going to have to go down. Well, at that time, there wasn't, they didn't check you for learning disabilities. And it turns out I had a few, like major ADD, you know, attention deficit. And, um, but I continued to perform, but I was doing it in a way that was breaking my heart and breaking the Lord's heart, but nobody knew it. 
And so the enemy used that as a way to continue to jerk me back every time I try to step forward to receive the good news of the gospel. That you know if you receive that, people are going to know who you are. And every year that went by that I did not accept that offer, it became more and more difficult. I actually cheated middle school. We, 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 uh, we actually switched schools. I went from a Christian school to a middle school, and I thought maybe this would be the opportunity to start a new path, and then fell behind in my coursework and under pressure said, nope, I, I got to produce. And I, I remember being around real Christians, and I remember hearing the gospel, but I was not able to grab hold of that offer because of the shame and the guilt of my past and the label that I had grabbed hold of um, that, was, that I was speaking over myself because of the words of the accuser. I know who you are. Uh, you're a cheater. You're a liar. You're a fraud. And so going into my senior year of college, I went on a missions trip in order to travel the world. I'm going to be very candid. It was not to save souls. Um, it was my ticket out. And so I knew enough of the word to pass this, this uh, admissions into this missions trip. And so they sent me as one of seven Americans off to join seven Ukrainians in Odessa, Ukraine. So I go to a third world country. I remember going to my pastor and saying, hey, I really want to go on a missions trip. And I'm thinking somewhere like Australia. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I've got a better idea. And so I found myself in a third world country. And I found myself thinking, what have I got myself into? And they're going through the rules. Like, if you break these rules, we will send you home. And so I found myself at 21 years old at the time, thinking, which of these rules can I break, get sent home, and not kicked out of my church? Because <laughs> this third world country business was not for me. And it was the first time that nobody cared about who my father was, what, whether I was on the football team or who what girl I was dating, they only want to know about my relationship with Jesus. And I remember this one Ukrainian girl talking about her relationship with Jesus, and she started crying. And it was an intimate cry. And I said to myself, I said, she talks about Jesus like, like he's her, like she's dating him. And it was totally foreign to me. And that's where the Lord revealed to me that even the demons know the name of Jesus and they tremble. And I was convicted during my time there that the demons are even better off than me because I don't even tremble at his name. Well, by God's grace, while I was there, I heard an offer of sonship an offer of the gospel, and I had a heart ready to receive it. And I just believe that all those prayers over all those years had worked, and God sent the hound to heaven after me. But the gospel was presented to me in such a way that he, like Hosea, was coming to find me. And he was saying, will you marry me? And here's what that looks like. I'm going to take your F, and I want you to take my A for performance, your disgusting rags for my robe of righteousness. And that was the first time the gospel clicked on me. I'm like, I've been doing that my whole life. I've been taking somebody else's A for my F. I was like, I'll do that. And I was shocked. That, that this was actually a real thing, that this was the good news of the gospel. And so I, I was like, I'm in. But then the next thing I had to deal with was the fact that, oh, but they all think you're already in. You were here, brought here as a, um, as a missionary. And so the, one of the leaders there saw me struggling. And then the guy that made the 
presentation was actually from Memphis, Tennessee, and he was leaving with his wife. And the missionary that was staying with us, who ended up being the best man at my wedding, he looked at me, he says, you need to talk to him, don't you? And I said, I do. And um, well, I didn't even say I do. I was just like a tear was coming down my eye. I was like shaking. He's like, go. So I'm running down the street of Odessa, Ukraine. This guy's already put his wife into the taxi. And I come running up to him. By the way, I was a preseason All-American college linebacker, benching 400 pounds and not having a neck. So I'm like, he, he said, Daniel, what, 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 uh, what's up? And I said, I want to accept your offer. He said, what offer? I was like, you know, my, my F for Jesus A. He was like, OK, is there something else you need to tell me? I was like, I've been cheating my entire life. My whole academic career has been a fraud. And he says, well, it's yours. Go and send no more. I got to go. See ya. And he gets in the taxi, and he leaves. And I return back. And everybody's like, what happened? The Holy Spirit said, you're free. Tell him. And so I would spend the rest of my time in Odessa telling people that, yeah, I came here to save you, and I got saved. So this is pretty cool. Here's my story. And I was able to go back home and continue to tell my story. And throughout my life, I've had to learn how to take on the identity of that son. And that's come through a lot of trials and heartache. One of the biggest one, ones was spending 10 years leading uh, the next generation and men, businessmen, um, after the leadership model of Jesus Christ and teaching them how to be the, the sons and the husbands and the fathers and the leaders that uh, is modeled in Jesus. And 13 years into my marriage, my marriage and family life blew up. And I found myself totally rejected from all the people that I had once served and been adored by only for God to take me through a threshing process to teach me that the idol of my heart was something that he wanted to rescue me from and release me from. It was a form of prostitution that he was no longer willing to cooperate with. But it was painful because I didn't even know really it was there, that the idolatry of my heart was a form of prostitution. And so I lost everything. And I, all these people I surrounded myself with to make myself look good and feel good about myself, and I really thought I was serving at the time, the Lord took me to a place of solitude so I could just hear from him and realize that although I don't have anybody else around me, I have the love of my father. And so slowly he brought me out of that, and he's been building me up through a congregation of people that love me and that hear his voice and speak those words over me. And so I am here tonight just as a testimony of God's goodness to me and his rescue. That's, at the end of the day, what the story of Hosea is all about. It's about his faithfulness in the midst of our unfaithfulness. Uh, the, the pain of infidelity that Hosea felt is the pain that the Father feels with us. And what he showed me during this process of seeking his voice in his heart after this passage was something that people that have not been in infidelity can understand. But, you know, the scripture says that when a husband and wife are made one, um, they're one in flesh and bones and spirit. And when infidelity takes place, it kills and it destroys everything that's special. And God showed me that's what my people do to me. Um, and so I, because I love them, I chose to take the cross and to be crucified by a thousand lashes to the heart. And the wounds that were inflicted on me was the sin of my people, the, the infidelity of my people. 
And then he said to me, do you know what my bride looks like? And I said, what does your bride look like? He said, my bride's a prostitute. And the problem with my people is they see themselves as the righteous. And they're playing the performance game. And he showed me that um, although all the commentators were focused either on Gomer or Hosea, the prophet or the prostitute, and all of the inworkings behind the scenes of that, he said, there's another character in here. And he took me to where she was purchased by Hosea for 15 shekels. And he said, who would she purchase who did he purchase her from? And I said, her, her pimp? And he said, yeah. The story should be about the prophet, prostitute, and the pimp. And he said, I have a corporate word for my people, for the organized church of religion, that he's about to bring justice to those who are pimping his people for profit. And he is moving to rescue the, the prostitute who doesn't see herself worthy to be rescued. And it's exciting time. I'm seeing acceleration in the harvest in my own life. Um, I was actually at a banquet uh, a few weeks back. That's me with a friend in the chair who broke her neck playing flag football in college. And Abby Johnson, who the movie Unplanned was created around. And Abby shared that night how she was responsible for 22,000 abortions. And the Lord showed me, he said, you know why there's a lack of sanctity in the marriage? It's because there's a lack of sanctity in, in life. And his burden for the baby in the womb, whose womb is supposed to be the safest place in the world, has become the tomb. And Abby shared how she thought she was doing a good thing, that she was a businesswoman and that this baby was just tissue until she actually watched on the video screen the baby fighting for his life um, and being ripped from limb to limb. And she turned away from that. and. The Lord was pressing in on me. This, he said, this isn't a matter of anti-abortion. This is a matter of pro-life. Anti-abortion is just filled with people that are committed to controlling women by telling them what they can and cannot do. Um, and again, they hide behind the banner of pro-life. But pro-life is just not only about the, the life in the womb of the mother, but the life that's delivered. So the anti-abortion folks that they they, uh, once you're born, that's it, you're on your own. But pro-life is life from conception to grave. And so the Lord started showing, he started leaning into that with me, that, that he is a God who spoke life into being. And his desire for me is to start speaking life over not only myself, but those around me. And he's showing me that the doors are wide open for the harvest. This is me going on for a run a couple weeks ago, and I'm running past this church of Scientology, and I see this guy holding this sign, and the Lord just said, stop and talk to him. And so I stopped, stopped and talked to him. His name's James. He's, uh, he's holding, you can't really see it, but he's holding an open, um, open house sign. And so I, I said, I introduced myself, and I said, you know, I find that sign providential. And he said, what does providential mean? And so I got to tell him about that and, and that how God works out all things. Uh, there are no accidents, and that I didn't believe that there was an accident that I was talking to him. And we went on to talk about the Church of Scientology and its worship of creation over the Creator. And in less than 22 minutes, this guy is literally confessing to identifying himself in the past as a Muslim and a current Scientologist and says, you're absolutely right. I need to claim my true identity as a child of God. And then he goes on to say everything that you're, but it's knowledge, it's knowledge, it's knowledge. And we went back to the Garden of Eden together and talked about the tree of knowledge versus the tree of life. And he says, I, I want to eat from the tree of life. 
And within 22 minutes, he received that offer of salvation, which was so encouraging to me because Abby Johnson, after that story, uh, painful story of 22,000 abortions, she said, we're living in a season and a time of conversion. God wants conversions. He desires conversions. He's this whole church hopping, you know, and, and just shuffling of the chairs within the church is not, is not where his heart is. And so here I am, I'm talking to this guy, and I'm like, what do I do? I talk to a guy outside of the Church of Scientology while I'm on a run. And next thing you know, he's receiving that offer of salvation. And he left after this picture and put down the sign and turned away from representing the Church of Scientology and chose to pursue the tree of life. So yeah, praise Jesus. And so we heard about Demi's story. We heard a little bit about the, the story of Hosea. The, the question that God put on my heart for us is, what, what is our story? And what will love look like in your life? What will love look like in my life? And are we willing to ask that difficult question on a daily basis? What does mercy look like in this situation? I desire mercy. He says, go and find out what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And in the context that Jesus puts it, as we know, only the sick need a physician. And his call to us to remember that he came to save the sinner, not the righteous. Let me pray. Father God in heaven, thank you that you are a rescuer, you are a redeemer. I pray that we'd hear the words that you speak over us, the words of, I love you, 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 that we would hear the call of the bridegroom who says, will you marry me? The call of the husband who says, will you return to me? Father, thank you for your scandalous love. And we receive this season of rapid acceleration and opportunity to gather in your harvest. And we thank you that you are speaking loudly and you're speaking clearly, not only to the ears of your people, but to their hearts as well. Thank you that we can trust you with our hearts. Thank you that you take our hearts of stone and replace them with hearts of flesh, moving us from the spirit of fear to the spirit of adoption that cries out, Abba, Father. We love you, Father. Thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name.